What is up, everybody? Welcome to Gaggly Geeks, episode two, Electric Boogaloo. That is not the name of this, but I'm going to call it that anyway. Welcome, everybody, to the show. Hope you all have had a good morning, had had a good weekend. Uh, it's been a few days since the weekend, but I was going to start this on Monday, so let's just pretend like it is a Monday, right? All right. So we got a few stories to talk about, a few things to cover, but first, let's jump into some of the stuff that maybe I had missed over the weekend, some things that maybe we should have covered, and it's not on our rundown, and that is Ant-Man 3. Ant-Man 3 is officially greenlit to be part of the MCU and completing its trilogy. Ant-Man is one of those movies where a lot of people really love him, a lot of people see Ant-Man as more of a supporting character. The movies themselves haven't reached a billion like the other top performing Marvel films, but they still have a pretty big following. And Ant-Man has done a good job of being able to kind of bring in people from other Marvel properties and make them bigger. So I think with Ant-Man 3, we have an opportunity to do that, which is why I wanted to talk about it. Fantastic Four. We've not really heard much of anything about it. Kevin Feige has said that he is considering bring him in, that they're going to be in at Phase 5. And, I mean, I don't know, to me that feels wrong. Why would you have uh, Fantastic Four in Phase 5? There should be a chance to be able to bring that into a different phase. Whether Ant-Man is going to be a 5 or 4 phase remains to be seen. I know that they're going to start filming it, and uh, it should come out around 2022. And uh, it's going to be shooting after Thor Love and Thunder when Taika Waititi is done with the Jojo Rabbit campaign to jump over there. So we don't know what is actually happening as far as the story goes with this. But here's my theory. We have the Quantum Realm. We have the past movie that really heavily features it and features the fact that there's a lot of people that could be trapped inside of the Quantum Realm that maybe Michelle Pfeiffer's character didn't know. That maybe we could bring into the story. So there's a chance, and this is all a theory in my mind, in my crazy brain, that there's a chance that when Hank... Pim and uh, Janet Van Dyme are back together. Maybe they maybe they miss a few colleagues that went missing. There were four colleagues that maybe they had back in the day that worked at this Baxter building and that had a lot of similarities, you might say, to the Fantastic Four. Maybe they won't outrightly say that it's them, but I could really see them pitching this. So that, I don't know, that's my beginning to this because I want, I don't know. I think that, I think that's the best way to bring in the Fantastic Four, if it were me. And we kind of have seen so many Marvel properties at this point that we know what to expect with how they sew things in. So that remains to be seen, but comment down below. What do you guys think of Ant-Man 3? Are you excited for it? Are you not excited? Are you confused why it's in a Marvel film and not going down to Disney streaming, leave a comment down below. Let me know. All right. Now let's get into the first topic of the day, and that is Batman casting news. We have been getting a lot of Batman casting news from last week with, uh, oh crap. How do I, why do I always forget his name? With Jeffrey Wright playing Commissioner Gordon, we now have official news for other casting, I guess, possibilities. The Batman is eyeing Colin Farrell for the Penguin and Andy Serkis as Alfred Pennyworth. Now, for me, if you hear if you hear those things right off the top of your head, you think that maybe I read that backwards and that Colin Farrell is playing like a younger, more savvy Alfred and Andy Serkis is playing the Penguin, which I think was hinted at a few times when they were doing a casting call looking for people. I know that there was a few Photoshop pictures of Andy Serkis as Penguin and they looked really good. But Alfred? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Well, let's see. These both came uh, respectively. The rap took the Andy Circus story and uh, Colin Farrell. The news broke from Deadline, so I wanted to make sure that those two are credited. Uh, Andy Circus is in talks to play Alfred Pennyworth, Bruce Wayne's trustworthy butler. And sources tell Variety, and uh, and they they I'm reading this from their article, actually. From Variety, while Colin Farrell is being eyed to play the uh, famous Batman villain Penguin, it remains to be seen if both of them are actually confirmed or not. It's still just conjecture. Uh, Andy Serkis is currently working on bringing Venom 2 to the big screen. He's cast as, well, he's set to direct that film. So he's got a lot of stuff on his plate. Um, whether that means that Alfred Pennyworth's role is big or small in this, I don't know for sure. But I know that with Matt Reeves and Andy Serkis as kind of like the dynamic duo, which they are, they, they're comparable to Scorsese and De Niro, 
I, I think he's got a exciting part to play if he's interested in this specifically. Whether it's big or small is remaining to be seen. The big, I guess, what if for me is in Colin Farrell being Penguin. Um, I just, I know he's a great actor. I know Colin Farrell is a fantastic actor. If you haven't seen him, Bruges, or you haven't seen The Lobster, or or any of his work, definitely go and check out more than just Bullseye from Daredevil. All you just superhero sweaties, there's a lot more to be geeky about with this guy. But anyway, to have him play the Penguin, we are clearly going for a more somewhat attractive, more more sleek looking Penguin. I doubt they're going to put that face on the screen to hide it or to cover it in a fat suit or do something like that. So I don't think they're really going for the conventional way that Penguin looks. However, when you think about the fact that Jonah Hill was in talks to play Penguin, it they're either going to be going as close to typecasting Penguin or as far away from casting Penguin. Uh, and, and they've just shown us both. Or they could just be, a, this could be a ruse for both of them and they've actually already cast a Penguin. Uh, Josh Gad has also been vying a lot to play this role. Ever since actually it was announced that Mass, Matt Reeves was doing the Batman, he was gunning for the Penguin. And uh, yeah, I mean, to see, to see a character that uh, the Penguin inherently is not Colin Farrell. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. You can disappear as much as you want, but at the end of the day, when I look at Colin Farrell, I'm not going to see an umbrella and I'm not going to see the wah, 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 laugh. I don't think any of that works with him. That being said, I don't think this is a necessarily, if this goes through, a train wreck idea like it was for Jesse Eisenberg to play, um, to play Lex Luthor. Mainly because I think Colin Farrell has a lot more acting ability and, and and performance in him than Jesse Eisenberg might have had playing uh, Lex Luthor. And I think as far as directing goes, they do have a little bit better of a director to understand character and work within that in Matt Reeves. So we'll see what what's to say about that. What do you guys think? Do you have one or the other that you're more a fan of? What do you think of uh, the first story with Commissioner Gordon with Jeffrey Wright playing him um who is your dream casting for me personally I would not be upset if you just brought back Danny DeVito like I don't care how old he is or you he is the penguin and will always be the penguin for me at least let's jump into the next story and this story is actually not really a story as much as it is a, a review that's right Starting now and and maybe moving forward into the into the next coming months while I while I'm working out the kinks for Gaggle of Geeks, I'm gonna be posting some of my reviews from here and then chopping them up and putting them up in individual videos so that you don't have to watch this whole show to see it, but you can still see a review coming out. And for this episode, we're gonna be talking about Midway because the embargo has lifted for today. We can finally talk about it. This is directed by Roland Emmerich. Uh, if you know him from Independence Day, Independence Day Resurgence, uh, stars Ed Screen, Patrick Wilson, uh, Luke Evans. It's a historical telling of the Battle of Midway through the perspective of those on the ground and in the air. That is basically events that happened bef- uh, after Pearl Harbor. It was a big uh, battle that really was one of the uh, linchpins to World War II and, and did establish a turning point for the allies during that time so this is emmerich whose previous work again like from independence day he's hoping to redeem himself with uh with a little bit more substance than i guess independence day resurgence had and while it's it's he's going for a hard a hard epic like thriller It, it very much is in the vein of michael bay's pearl harbor um there's a lot of dog fighting there there's some small character developments with with each thing but there's a lot of side stories which we'll get into uh, while it's epic in scale though midway can't really carry its own weight on takeoff and in the story the narrative the characters that it built it ends up sinking the movie completely because of it so let's get into why the, the acting first of all our, our lead character at screen you might know him from deadpool who uh, he played ajax uh he plays a one of the pilots in this story that is kind of more of the uh, big uh, big leaders that that when he goes up in the air he doesn't care whether he goes back or not he doesn't care what's happening as long as the mission is complete and 
I think Ed Screen is a good actor. I think as far as his abilities go, he can definitely hold being a leading man. But in this film, he just really didn't have enough to, to chew on when it comes to dialogue, when it comes to just the, enough time for his story to really be fleshed out. There wasn't anything for that. But the supporting cast, albeit not really like getting a lot of time as well as him, they all seem to do their job fairly well. Uh, the supporting cast perform well, much like Screen. Uh, there's not enough time to focus on any one character to make the films. And it makes the film a little bit hollow, uh, surface level. And Joe Jonas, I mean, I, I remember what, we were sitting watching the movie, me and a couple other friends, and uh, when Joe Jonas had come up on screen, one of them turned to me and said, how many damn boy band characters are going to be involved in these wartime films? Because Dunkirk uh, infamously had Harry Styles in the film. And with this, they're going with Joe Jonas. Uh, he, I think for the most part, he actually plays his character pretty well. Um, I don't see him as a horrible actor, but there is a little bit of an adjustment once you see him in there. And I don't think that's something he's going to escape until he's a leading man, his own in his own film and can maybe go past the uh, music spotlight. But in any case, his character was pretty good. Woody Harrelson did a great job. Dennis Quaid played his uh, very angry general with a very, very, he had an accent that was a lot like, we're going down into the place and we're going to destroy everything. As deep a girl as he can. It seemed like he was going for even like a Harrison Ford um, from the movie 42 feel. And I, I he played his, the best version that he could. The problem with the film is just they don't have enough time with each individual character so that when you cut to him and you move into the battle, it's so fast that you're just like getting like basically drug into the next scene when you're still wanting to learn more about what you're looking at from the scene before. Uh, the film is wall to wall with action and dogfighting. The story begins in Pearl Harbor and we spend most of the first act showcasing that battle. Uh, and in some cases, the effects for the aerial dogfighting, the explosions, the battleships, all look very realistic. They look really good, but it's really PlayStation looking towards towards second act. When you, when you keep seeing the same shots of, of a plane barreling down on a ship, almost exact the shot for shot scenes from like one battle to another just reused it seems like everything can seem unimportant and in midway it has that especially when it comes to the story and i don't know there, there's not too much that i, I really want to cover with this film because like, once it was over it, it feels like you've just been hit in the head so many times with like concussive bangs and like all of these loud noises with with no substance to it and and a story that you want to connect with, but you just can't because the characters aren't really there. It's very repetitive. The pacing is off. If you feel the runtime in this movie, it, it's a film that you've seen already with Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor. But almost, in a, I might even say that I like Pearl Harbor better than Midway because at least with that, you have some charismatic acting done by Ben Affleck. And I, I just don't know with this one. I, it definitely wasn't the movie that I was expecting. It's not the best film that you're going to be seeing this year. I wouldn't highly recommend this, but if you're a fan of war films, you do like that genre of filmmaking, I definitely would go and check it out just in that sense. But if you guys feel like after seeing the trailer, you, you don't really miss anything, then I would say don't worry about it. I'm going to give Midway a 5 out of 10. What do you guys think about it? Uh, it's coming out this weekend, so go ahead and check it out. Let me know in the comments below what you think. And, yeah, midway through the movie, I uh, did not like it. How about that? <laughs> okay, so jumping in to the last story. Man, I've only been going for about 15 minutes, and we are just rushing through this. I guess that's what happens when it's just one person doing this. With, uh, with this show, we're definitely looking to add a rotating panel of guests so if you are watching this or if you've seen me before doing any of this stuff and also are a geek and would like to join this gaggle uh, be a part of a rotating crew of uh, people jumping in and having their voices heard having uh, great thoughts and insights about films be on this show with me uh, leave a comment send me a message on instagram or whatever and we will make that happen uh, another quick while we're on the business end of this stuff. If you guys haven't checked this out yet, Patrick Beatty Reviews is now a website and you will get all of my reviews from there. Uh, I've really started to transition more into the written form as far as uh, reviews go, just because there are you, it really helps 
to be doing more than just one thing as far as your reviews. Video reviews have been something that I've done since the beginning, and I've loved it always. Uh, I've loved being able to make the intros. I've loved being able to just like have fun with you guys and be on camera. But with the rate of films that come out, and it's literally like this week, for instance, I think I have four screenings that I'm going to. Um, it, it's not super sustainable to make a video for each one and put in enough effort and enough time that I was doing with the previous ones to really justify it. So patrickbeattyreviews.com is the new place to find all of the reviews. Anything that you're wanting. Uh, this uh, The uh, Midway review is already up right now. Um, if you haven't checked out, th there's the Lighthouse that I just recently reviewed. Um, Dolomite Is My Name is a fantastic film. I highly recommend that. Uh, Parasite is coming up soon, as well as the Jojo Rabbit review. So go ahead and check that out. Make sure to follow it. And that is the end of that. Let's escape the rambling of a crazy man just begging people to subscribe and go into the next story, which is a, an opinion article that came out over the weekend. Uh, we were talking, well, I was talking on social media a little tiny bit about Martin Scorsese's recent comments about Marvel films. If you are not aware of this, I'll give you a quick synops a synopsis, essentially, during the, the time frame that Walking Phoenix's Joker has been coming out, there's been a lot of dis discussion from different filmmakers, but specifically Scorsese, about Marvel films and their effect on the film uh, genre in general. Uh, he went on to say that Marvel films aren't necessarily uh, films, uh, considered cinema, that they seem more like theme park rides or roller coaster rides. And that, of course, upset all of the people, all of the sweaties. Um, I, he got a lot of backlash on that one. Uh, his, uh, another director, one of, these two are some of the greatest directors who have ever lived, first of all. So if they walk up to you and they say, hey, Marvel movies aren't necessarily cinema, you say, yes, thank you, sir. Shine their suit, shoes and ask if there's anything else you can do. This is not an okay boomer situation. This is, and he goes to really like bring that in uh, as far as the article goes. Let me cover a little bit. I highly recommend you go check it out. It's at the New York Times. It's an op-ed from Martin Scorsese saying, I said Marvel films aren't cinema. Let me explain. What he essentially goes into with this um, in fact, I'll, I'll read a little bit. Many franchise films are made by people of considerable talent and artistry. You can see it on the screen. The fact that the films themselves don't interest me is a matter of personal taste and temperament. I know that if I were younger, if I'd come of age at a later time, I might have been excited by these pictures and maybe even wanted to make one by myself. But I grew up when I did, and I developed a sense of movies, of what they were and what they could be. That was as far from the Marvel Universe as we on Earth are from Alpha Centauri. For me, the filmmakers I came to love and respect, for my friends who started making movies around the same time that I did, cinema was about revelation, aesthetic, emotion, and spiritual revelation. It was about characters, the complexity of people, and their contradictory and sometimes paradoxical natures. The way they can hurt one another and love one another and suddenly come face to face with themselves. It was about confronting the unexpected on screen and in the life it dramatized and interpreted and enlarged the sense of what was possible in the art form. And that is the key. What What is an art form? And that's that's what Martin Scorsese says he goes on to discuss a little bit. What is considered art? What is considered theme parks? And, and he's even, he's he's not using the term theme park to try to talk down to what Marvel films are. Uh, he, he referenced specific films uh, of Alfred, Hitch, Alfred Hitchcock's uh, that literally take place inside of a theme park at the end with strangers on a train, Rear Window, Psycho, they all have these thrilling moments, and they all seem like theme park rides. And I think with Martin Scorsese, he did not spend the 10 years that all of us did watching and connecting and relating to all of these superhero characters. He was too busy making incredible films and being an tour and a genius. So there's really nothing that I that I would say is, like, we gotta stop picking on, on older, older directors and, and people that have been here for a while that maybe see these new trends and have opinions on them. It's not anything that is affecting you or hurting you. If Martin Scorsese doesn't like Black Panther or hasn't seen Ant-Man 2, it's not, it's not going to hurt you in any way. I don't understand why people are so upset at these two, especially for the work and the stuff that they've done to bring this genre into the, into the zeitgeist. Uh, Scorsese specifically is the godfather of gangster films, which... 
that genre really didn't exist until Scorsese came into it and brought his own sensibilities into that. And I think that, sure, given the time, if you were to to watch all 23, 24 of the Marvel films, I'm sure he would have a different opinion. But I think what his point is, is that he, it's a different format. It's something that he's not accustomed to. And it's not necessarily that it's bad. It's just that it's not for him which I think is a great way to put it. I think he's one of the greatest directors to ever live, like I've said before. And Francis Ford Coppola also said a few things, and he's not really retracted anything like Martin Scorsese did, but I don't think Scorsese even needed to put this out, honestly. Um, what a what a fantastic man to be able to still want to reach out to the people that are criticizing him to try to explain what's happening. I think that's great. Um, and that that's really all I've got to say. But what do you think about the controversy with Scorsese with with the comments that he made uh whatever you think leave a comment down below I think that's about all for this episode Whew, that was a quick one and that is it make sure to subscribe make sure to follow the website patrickbatyreviews.com follow me on my social pages and we will see you at the next review